That was awesome. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus? Amen. Amen. Teens, you are dismissed. Beautiful singing. Thank you, team. Uh, what a great job this morning. And I know that was an immense help to us. Wasn't it, church? It's great to hear some good music. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Pastor Nathan, for leading that. Well, we've been in the book of Colossians. And uh, we've been walking verse by verse through the book of Colossians. We entitled this series, what? Jesus is enough. And uh, isn't that the truth of it? Jesus truly is enough. And uh, we've been walking verse by verse. In the first chapter, we kind of saw some some introduction, if you will, from Paul, a typical way of writing a letter, if you will, uh, to people around the world. And Paul followed his familiar custom, where he'd write to them talking about grace and peace, which, by the way, only comes from Jesus Christ. He talked about the power of the gospel and how that the gospel was changing their lives and also was spreading to the community around them. And that's how the gospel works. It's not something to be contained. It's something to share. And uh, you see how this is working out. Now, if you remember, where's Paul at this point? Paul is under house arrest where? In Rome. And Epaphras, a young preacher boy from the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus, has come to him, who we believe was probably pastoring, planting, or both of this church. He came out to him and talked about some great things that are happening at this church at Colossae, but also an issue that is happening. And the issue that was happening was is that there was this erroneous teaching that was trying to infiltrate this young church and pull them away from the truth that Jesus is enough. And today, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, we talked in the first chapter how Jesus is supreme. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is God? Amen. Jesus is sufficient. Aren't you thankful that the blood of Jesus Christ washes away sins? It's eternally secure through Jesus Christ. We saw here that he's supreme. We saw that he's sufficient. We saw how Paul kind of laid out some of his ministry in the playbook of his life. We saw kind of a frank talk from Paul at the beginning of chapter 2 where you see how Paul is saying, look, embrace the truth because if you embrace truth and you engage your walk with Jesus Christ, you can expose lies. That's what he was saying. If you don't know the truth, how would you know what is truth and error? You have to know the truth to be able to expose what is not truth. And then from there, last week, we talked about how we are complete in Jesus and what Jesus does for us. He cleansed our life, right? He canceled our debt and he conquered our foes. Well, today we're going to have to get into maybe something a little bit more negative, something that while maybe a little bit different, it's still Bible. We're going to walk through it. Today, we're going to talk about religious counterfeits. Now, I was a cashier at Albertsons when I was 18 years old. I know what you're thinking. Why would they put an 18-year-old in charge of working a, uh, a cashier uh, a stand there at Albertsons? Well, I had been there for a few years and all of that, and I enjoyed what I was doing. That's when the, uh, the self-checkouts first started coming out. Who likes the self-checkouts? That's not how it used to be. <laughs> Nobody liked the self-checkouts before. They're like, I want the personal touch. I want everybody to go through the cashier line. But then you realize you can get through faster if you just did it yourself, right? So they start going through the self-checkouts and they don't have to wait in the lines and stuff like that. But that's when they were first coming out. I was working one of my uh, one of the cashier lines there. They would come through. And something that they taught us is whenever you had bills come through that were 20 or higher, you had to mark them with a special marker. Why would we do that? To know if it was a counterfeit or real, right? Counterfeit. Well, do you realize that there are counterfeit religions in our world today? There are those that claim truth that are actually completely opposed to truth. And Paul is going to talk about that here in this chapter this morning. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of, of the word of God. We're in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. Verse 16 says, Let not man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Verse 18, Let not man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, and taste not, and handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom 
in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, maybe you're reading that and you're going, where is pastor going to go today? Well, we'll talk about it here in a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul and how he was willing to be used uh, by you for the cause of Christ. I pray, Lord, that we, again, we'd be receptive to the word of God, that we'd apply the truths of this, of this word today, and that we would remind ourselves that we truly are complete in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, Paul the Apostle has already talked about here in this book of Colossians a little bit about the insistence of some people to tell the other men to be circumcised. This past uh, message last week, we talked about circumcision and baptism in particular. And, uh, and now he gets into the whole idea of these rigorous religious activities that some were pushing on others to make them holy. Now it is estimated that there are no less than 10,000 religions in this world. And you wonder why people are confused. 10,000 religions in this world. 85% of all people in the world identify with one of these religious systems. The largest religions are Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Judaism, and Sikhism. Now, if you were to look up the dictionary definition of religion, it would simply say this. It is an institutionalized system of faith, worship and practice an institutionalized system of faith worship and practice and by the way that's sort of what james identifies in the word in james 127 pure religion and undefiled before god and the father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world in that passage he was talking about people who claim to be religious people living out their faith but essentially Religion is mankind's attempt to reach God. Whereas the Bible portrays a God who has reached down to mankind. Do you see the difference? It's people saying, I want to get to God. I'm going to make up a system of approach to get there. Whereas the Bible presents a God who has already made himself available to every person. Religion is an interesting word, and I find people like to use that word in describing themselves more often than they like to describe something personal. They want to relate to a system rather than a person. Rather than people saying, I love Jesus, I have a relationship with Jesus, some people will say, well, I'm a religious person. I follow this religious belief. I'm a part of this belief system. So I, today, I am looking at religion as portrayed here in the book of Colossians under these three categories, and you should write it down. It's rules without reason. It's systems without substance. And it's belief without Bible. It's rules without reasons. It's systems without substance and its beliefs without Bible. So let me say that all again one more time for those that are still writing. Rules without reasons, systems without substance, beliefs without Bible. Now you remember during the gospels that Jesus' biggest enemies were what? Religious people. <laughs> they were his biggest enemies. Actually, Jesus' harshest words were reserved for religious leaders. Now, sometimes religion gets pretty crazy, right? Does it not? Have you ever looked this up? I'll, I'll give you a few examples. There is a breakaway sect of Hinduism where the adherents live near cremation grounds. And part of their worship system is to eat, in part, the cremated corpses of those who have deceased. Yikes. Right? Right now you're going, thank you for Christianity. There's a group of Hindus and Muslims in India who throw their children from one to two years old off of a 50 foot tower. 50 foot tower, one to two years old. And underneath is a set of men holding a sheet to catch the children. 
They practice this because they believe this will make the kids smarter, healthier, and last one, luckier. There are Native American tribes in our own country who after a four-day fast go into a holy place for a festival to their sun god. And when they go into this holy place, they will pierce their chest with little skewers and attach the skewers to a pole to be suspended in air so that they can be in better touch with their sun god. There's a group in New Mexico of people who will flog themselves till they are bloody. And every year on Good Friday, they reenact the crucifixion in many cases with real nails. Now, 2000 years ago, when Christianity was spreading around the Roman Empire, churches were being planted. And one of those churches was in this city called Colossae. Now, Colossae was in the Lycus Valley on the Lycus River, and it was situated on a main route at that time. Later on in history, during the time of this writing, it had been relegated and forgotten in many cases. It wasn't this big city. But originally, this was a big city that was situated on a main route. It was a trade route that connected the east to the west. And so at one point, you had people that were pouring in from all around the world that would take this, this highway, if you will, between the east and the west that would bring them through the city of Colossae. And when they would do that, they would bring goods and services, but they also brought philosophies, religions, and ideologies. And those were being sort of collected into this amalgamation, this, this, this hodgepodge of what, solid, of what scholars call the Colossian heresy, later known as Gnosticism. It was a mixture, really, of different religious systems. It included Greek philosophy, polytheism, Roman polytheism, Jewish legalism, as well as various cults of different gods and goddesses. So, if you will, it was this huge, circular dabble of a lot of different belief systems all mixed into one called the Colossian heresy. And people were just sort of taking parts of those religious systems and then just combining it more and more. Does that sound kind of like today? People just take different religious systems and combine them together more and more to fit whatever they want to believe for maybe even just that day. This was affecting those new believers that were in this church that had been taught that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They had been taught that Jesus is enough. This was starting to affect these new believers. And uh, really not that much different than people today. You know, I've noticed that a lot of folks today like to make their own religious systems by sort of approaching religion as a buffet. You stand there and you just sort of pick and choose the parts you want to eat and what you don't like, you just throw away. Or you don't put it on your plate. People do that with religious systems. They take various portions of beliefs and ideologies that suit themselves, their favorite parts. It's kind of like a large helping of Eastern philosophy. A small order of Christianity, but hold the guilt. Just, just give me the love. I'm on a guilt-free diet this week. Anybody doing diets right now? It's been a rough summer, right? You know, a lot of good food out there. Now you're kind of getting into the winter months, trying to get back in the routine. But hold, hold a little bit of guilt there. and Maybe add a little side of karma and throw in some new age spices. And now I've got my religion for today and tomorrow. I'll see what I want to deal with. So that is what is happening in this city in Colossae. Paul, who writes this letter while under house arrest in Rome, is thinking, what can I do to help prevent these young Christians who are growing in their faith? We talked about that in chapter one, the power of the gospel. It develops you, it grows you, it deploys you. That are growing in their faith, but they are starting to succumb or starting to fall for religious counterfeits. How can I protect them? How can I help them engage truth? So in our text this morning, Paul will describe three religious counterfeits to be aware of and avoid. Number one, the counterfeit of legalism. The counterfeit of legalism. Look at verses 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow. You see that word there? Say that with me. Which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So it's pretty apparent in these first two verses of this text today, that Paul is thinking about external practices, right? He mentions food, drink, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, 
All of these are external activities. All of these are celebrations. Legalism is essentially, you should write this down, the religion of human achievement. It is the religion of human achievement. It is the religion that says, I will earn my way to God. If you really want to boil it down simply, it's a workspace salvation. It's what it is. Now, if you think about it, there's really only two religions in the world. Isn't that crazy? You can take 10,000 religions and boil it down to two. I don't know about you. I like to simplify things. Who likes chaos and confusion? <clears throat> things are so chaotic, confusing, right? There's a whole lot of, a whole lot of division in our world, but we can just simplify the approach. What is it? Well, you can really bring all religions into two approaches to God. Approach number one, human achievement. Approach number two, divine accomplishment. Human achievement, divine accomplishment. So every single religious system other than Christianity is in column number one, human achievement. It's all about what I do. It's something that I perform. It's something that I add to. Only Christianity can you approach God purely by his grace. And by the way, it's a free gift. You don't work for it. You don't add to it. What do you do with a gift? You receive it. It's either by your works, human accomplishment, or by his finished work, divine accomplishment. So legalism is the Jesus plus mentality. Jesus plus and add in. It's Jesus plus ceremony. Here in this passage before us, what's Jesus plus circumcision or baptism? Jesus plus personal piety. Jesus plus religious activity. Have you noticed it's easy to do a bunch of stuff but really not mean it in your heart? You're just doing it to do it because it's expected of you? Or you have you feel guilty if you don't? Right? Jesus plus religious activity. Jesus plus mystical spirituality. But I want you to understand this. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But catch this, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's how God sees it. Now, Paul has already mentioned, as we saw last week, two different rituals, circumcision and baptism. Now, you will notice that there are two more things that these religious legalists are hung up on. And really, you can boil them down to diets and days. Diets and days. Look at the diets. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. And then days, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath day. So, dietary regulations and specific days of worship. Now, let's begin with the first, diets. Evidently, part of the system that was trying to infiltrate this church at Colossae is they were telling people, you have to go back and keep the laws of the Old Testament that govern dietary restrictions. And in Leviticus chapter 11, we see specifically what they cannot eat. I'm just going to boil it down for you. No bacon. And you're like, Lord, no, please no. <laughs> bacon? You're like, does that include turkey bacon? Who eats turkey bacon? Where are you? Oh, I'm seeing my hands, they're like this, you know? <laughs> turkey bacon's not that bad, but get the real thing, okay? Bacon, you know? No bacon. <laughs> no ham. No scallops. No crab. We're the seafood people. My mom's from Maryland. Crab all the way. No lobster. You save a lot more money. I'll catch this one. No bats. No badgers. No camels. No lizards. If you're really hungry out in the desert, look, you know. No rats. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, look, I don't need a commandment that tells me not to eat rats and not to eat bats, okay? And I get that. I'm good with that, too. I don't need a commandment for that. But I want you to understand something. There is nothing in the New Testament that tells Christian believers what they should and should not eat. There's nothing. There are no dietary regulations. They say, oh, I can do whatever I want. Listen. Okay, practically, think that through. Your doctor <laughs> might instruct you on what to eat or not to eat for what? Health reasons. Okay, think that through. 
But I want you to get this. There are no spiritual reasons given in the New Testament for diet. There's practical. There's no spiritual. In fact, Jesus said in Mark 7, 18, and he saith unto them, are ye so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. Do you realize that comment from Jesus to Jews around him would have been earth shattering? What? I thought we had to. That would have been earth shattering to their belief system. And here the Messiah comes along and says, does it matter what you eat? Actually, Paul continues this in Romans 14, 7, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Your meat and drink doesn't make you holy. Jesus does. The Holy Spirit within you does. So a diet can't make you holy. Let's go to days, next are days. And he mentions them as a festival, a new moon. That's a monthly celebration or Sabbaths. Now, contrary to what some people think, Christians are nowhere in the New Testament required to keep the Sabbath day. And some of you might go, what? Let me explain. The Saturday Sabbath that begins Friday at sundown and ends Saturday at sundown is an Old Testament sign of a covenant that God made with the children of Israel. New Testament believers are never required to keep the Sabbath any more than they're required to keep Yom Kippur, Pesach, Sukkot, or other special events on the Jewish calendar. These are Old Testament regulations. And I'm gonna give you a few reasons why we don't today. Number one, we are in the new covenant. That was the old covenant. God specifically stated that keeping the Sabbath day was for the Jewish nation. So New Testament believers are never told to keep that. Number two, the early church began worshiping not on Saturdays, but on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Why? Because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. So they wanted Sunday to be a day of worshiping their resurrected Savior. So their worship time came to Sundays to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then third, when the Jews in Jerusalem found out that Gentiles had received Christ, they were, they were surprised by this. They're like, what? Wait, is that really happening? Gentiles are getting saved? So they wrote them a letter and they gave them some requirements in Acts chapter 15, verses 27 through 29. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who, also, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Okay, what are these necessary things that these Jewish, that are now Christian, Christian leaders are expecting of these Gentile believers? That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. For which of ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Is there anything mentioned in there about the Sabbath? Nothing. In fact, did you know that Paul the Apostle said this in Romans 14, 5? One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now you might be thinking, okay, pastor, which day should we worship God then? Oh, you're ahead of me. Thanks, Brother Leo. See, while our church follows the Sunday worship model of congregating together. Which, by the way, aren't you thankful that we come together and worship God together? Yes. By the way, it's not just Sunday that we do that. We do that Thursday night's Bible study as well at 7 o'clock at my house. Come on out. What are you scared of? There's food. <laughs> There's coffee. <laughs> come on out. Be a part of that. But we do follow the Sunday worship model where we congregate together. But just like Brother Leo said, every day is an opportunity to worship God. You don't have to come to church to worship God throughout the week. You can worship God on a Monday, on a Tuesday, and on a Wednesday, and on a Thursday, especially a Bible study at 7 o'clock. Did I mention that earlier? <laughs> Friday, and Saturday, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Every day is an opportunity to worship God. Now, here's why legalism is a counterfeit. In verse 17, it says this, which are a shadow of things to come. What was that word again? Shadow. Say it. Shadow. The body is of Christ. Think about this. Notice the difference between shadow and substance. 
A shadow has no reality unless it's Peter Pan, right? It's a reality that creates the shadow. A shadow doesn't create reality. Reality creates a shadow. Would you ever hug the shadow of your spouse? Why would you when you have your spouse to hug? Would you ever pet the shadow of your dog? You're like, maybe for fun now. Don't do that. <laughs> Why would you do that if there's a dog there that casts the shadow? Would you ever eat the shadow of an In-N-Out burger? <laughs> it might be more healthy for you. <laughs> but why would you do that when you can have that delicious burger right there? Who's hungry? Yes. See, why settle for a shadow when you can enjoy the substance of a real thing? Legalism is living in a shadow way. Now, why is legalism so dangerous that Paul comes at it this way? He says, let no man therefore judge you. Why? Why is it so dangerous? Why is legalism so dangerous here? Because anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. You can be unsaved and check all the boxes. Right? Oh, I did this. I did that. Anyone can conform to a regiment of external standards and not have a reality of salvation through Jesus Christ on the inside. Checking the boxes of Christianity while not living in the basket of Jesus Christ. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Do you see what he's saying there? Works-based righteousness. What is, this, what is this thing that I must do to inherit eternal life? And I love that Jesus began where that young man was. He began in Judaism. He said, well, thou knowest the commandments. And the young man said, master, all these have I observed from my youth. <laughs> oh, the one perfect guy. Check, 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 right? I can do all of these accomplishments and look spiritual. I've kept all the regulations. But then Jesus really nailed his heart to the wall here. Look at Mark 10, 21. It should be in your notes. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And look at verse 22. And he, this, this young rich man, was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. See, Jesus knew that, that that man was worshiping his material possessions. His stuff is what really mattered to him. Money was really his focus in life. And that was truly his little G God. Now, the Apostle Paul would know from personal experience what a legalist was because he himself, at one point, was an ardent legalist. In Philippians chapter 3, he talks about how he was a Pharisee in the extreme. Listen to what he says here. Though I, may, I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. I've done more. And then he lays it out. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. He was one of the few people in his day that knew specifically what tribe he came from. The tribe of Benjamin. And Hebrew of the Hebrew, as touching the law of Pharisee, so ardent followers of the law and regulations concerning zeal, how I demonstrated my ardent desire to follow uh, my religious systems, I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. Nobody can hold anything. Nobody could grab anything onto me because I followed the law to a T. If you will, Paul would say, look, I checked and I checked it. And I checked it, and I checked it, and I checked it. I checked all the boxes. I kept the regimen of external standards. That's the religion of human achievement. That's what legalism is. But I want you to see what Paul says after that. Look at verse 7 of Philippians 3. But when things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. 
I think Paul found the better thing that was no longer a shadow, but was substance, for real. It wasn't legalism. It was a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we see the counterfeit of legalism. Number two, the counterfeit of mysticism. The counterfeit of mysticism. Look at verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increase it with the increase of God. Now, mysticism, what does that mean, right? Mysticism is the desire, the pursuit of, of a deeper spiritual experience. It is the desire, the pursuit of a deeper spiritual experience. By the way, you hear that and you're like, that doesn't sound wrong. You know, like, who wants to have a closer walk with God? Right? You want to have a deeper pursuit into your walk with the Lord. All of us should want that. But some go so deep that they fall off the deep end. You ever heard that phrase before? Right? And they start making stuff up. And that's where it gets very dangerous. Notice how Paul writes it. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So they're making this stuff up. It's not God's rules. They're not God's regulations. So mysticism says that there is a spiritual reality, a, a spiritual experience that is above human intellect and natural senses. But here's the problem with mysticism. Unlike legalism, which looks for truth in externals, mysticism is all internal. It's all about sensation. It's not about revelation. So it's all about feelings. It's all about intuition. It's all about mood. It's all about perceptions, which by the way, all of those are subjective. They're not objective. They change from moment to moment, from person to person. For example, to a mystic, feelings during a worship song are far more important and more valid than just having a Bible study. Because I feel it. I feel it, man. Lord's working. By the way, does the Lord work during a worship song? Yes, he does. <clears throat> So the question becomes not what you know or what is true for a mystic. The question becomes, how do you feel? How do you feel? Now, why is this so dangerous? Well, it's dangerous on every level, not just in church. It's dangerous in society, is it not? By the way, the same thinking dominates Western society today, even when it comes to gender. Because now it's not about biology or reality. Now it's about identity. Well, who do you feel you are today? If you're a boy who feels like a girl, okay, you're a girl then. And by affirming this, we deny biology, we deny reality, and we opt for a mystical identity that's contrary to God's design. One author said this, first we overlook evil, then we permit evil, then we legalize evil, then we promote evil, then we celebrate evil, and then we persecute those who still call it evil. Have we seen that in our world? Yes. Now that's Paul's concern here with mysticism. Paul's concern is that at first they're just going to overlook this mysticism. Oh, it's harmless. They're just feeling things out. Oh, well, people have different ways. It's okay. They're, they're just sticking to themselves. So they'll, then they'll overlook it. And then they're going to permit mysticism. Well, it should be a part of it. They can, they can do whatever they want. And then they're going to celebrate it. And then pretty soon, they're going to persecute anybody who says that that mysticism is wrong. Contrary to the word of God. So watch out for mysticism. Now, he gets more specific as to what this is in verse 18 when he writes, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. He mentions the word humility twice in our text this morning, by the way. And notice this, worshiping of angels. See, these people that were attempting to infiltrate this church in Colossae with their erroneous teaching believed in the sub-gods and goddesses. That, they were, that there was God, and there's people on earth, 
And between earthlings and God were all these thousands of different emanations and angelic beings, sort of like a bridge that connected humanity to God. So you had to go through this bridge of emanations, all these different angels, these sub-gods, to somehow get to God. And they, the Gnostics, these false teachers, with their transcendent ways and superior knowledge, would instruct these young believers that didn't really know the right way how to climb the ladder of these emanations to finally arrive before God's doorstep. And Paul calls it a voluntary humility. What is that? A false humility. Okay, that's what it is, a false humility. They are saying, well, I'm just a mere human. I have no right to go directly to God. I'm not good enough to go directly to God, so I must go through these emanations and these angels who then could take me to God. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <clears throat> Sounds familiar to me. Perhaps you were taught that you have no right to go directly to God. You're not good enough. You can't even go directly to Jesus. You got to go through Jesus, Mother Mary, who will connect me to Jesus, who will connect me to the Father, or perhaps go through saints, who will connect me to God. Uh, a few months ago, and I mentioned this before, my wife and I were out uh, canvassing an area with some outreach cards for our church and inviting people to come on Sunday. We were going through this neighborhood and this gentleman, very, very pleasant guy, just walking down the street on the sidewalk, approached us. And like anyone that does when I'm out, I talk to them, just try to uh, kind of carry a little bit of a conversation, invite them to church. But this man surprised me immediately. He walked up and he says, are you a Christian? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you want to debate? <laughs> I'm with my wife. I'm like, no, I don't. I, I, you know, I am not one of those guys that goes out there looking for a debate. I got way too much to do. I'm looking for the people that are looking for hope, okay? Not the people that are looking to stop me from getting those people that are looking for hope. So he says, do you want to bet? I said, no. And then he started mentioning things, and like my blood starts to boil a little bit. Brother Weaver, I should have read that book. I mean, you can't just get over it, because I was having a hard time getting over it. And he started asking me some questions, really, it was statements. Have you noticed that when you go to somebody, it's statements, it's accusations, right? I started going back and forth. And I'm like, I'm kind of standing there and I'm looking at my wife and my wife's looking at me and I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> going to step in and start talking. I was very gracious. Okay. I'm not here to, to put anybody down, but he was wrong. He was, his belief system is wrong. And you know what he told me in this conversation? He kept doing circular reasoning. By the way, that happens a lot. They get hung up on one thing and they keep circling back to that one thing. You could debunk it, but in their mind, it's such a, it's such a mental marker. It's such a, it's such a stronghold. They can't let go of it. Even if you prove that they're wrong. He kept just giving me spouting of his religion. I kept trying to give him Bible. Bible is stronger than any religious tradition, okay? Yep. That's man. It'll fall. The Bible won't. It'll never fade away. It will not return void. Anyways, in this conversation, he tells me, you don't have the credentials to go before God. Honestly, I've never had anybody tell me that before. I was like, What? And I just looked at him. Honestly, I was puzzled that he literally believed that. Because I wasn't part of his belief system. I can't go to God. I can't go through his route to get to God. And I just told him, I said, I didn't realize you needed credentials to talk to your dad. What does God call? Father. Our heavenly father. father. Folks, don't make it confusing. You don't go through some dude to get to God. You go straight to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. That guy is just as fallible as you. There is nobody holy, nobody that is sufficient outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. So don't make it confusing. Be simple about it. God didn't make this to where we can't figure out how to spend time with God and have a relationship with him. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Yep. When you worship or pray to anyone else besides God, you are decapitating your spiritual life. When you go to anyone else besides God, you are decapitating your spiritual life. Look at verse 19. And not holding the what? Head. From which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Who is the head of the body of Christ, the church? Who is it? Jesus. It's Jesus. If you can't have direct access to the head, how do you expect the body to function? That is spiritual growth only comes by direct union with Jesus. 
And by the way, you are allowed to direct union with God, Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the what? Father. Also, by the way, <laughs> worshiping angels is strictly forbidden in Scripture. Jesus was having a conversation with Satan at his temptation, and he said, For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. As a matter of fact, there was a time when the Apostle John, who had walked with Jesus for three and a half years on this earth, actually tried to worship an angel. In the book of Revelation, he's getting all these visions and dreams and revelations from angelic uh, emissaries. And it says in Revelation 19.10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. Can you imagine just John being overloaded by all of this? Whoa. And falling to his knees and worshiping this messenger. And the messenger said unto him, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. What's the next two words? Worship God. Worship God. The counterfeit. A mysticism. Number three, the counterfeit of asceticism. The counterfeit of asceticism. <laughs> Colossians 2.20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is the living in the world? Are you subject to ordinances, requirements? Touch not, uh, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So asceticism is the neglect of the body. It is a rigorous self-denial to be righteous. Asceticism is a rigorous self-denial to be righteous, a neglect of the body. So legalism, to break this down simply, is all about what you do. Mysticism is all about how you feel. Asceticism is all about what you don't do. <laughs> what you don't permit yourself to have. So legalism is all about what you do. Mysticism is all about how you feel. Asceticism is all about what you don't do. What you don't permit yourself to have. Throughout church history, if you've ever studied any history as far as the church goes, different periods, some have believed that to be a Christian, you have to reject anything that is good, anything that is beautiful, anything that is comfortable in order to somehow pursue God with your life. In other words, if you want to follow God, it's got to hurt. They rejected marriage. They rejected sex within marriage. They rejected parenthood. They, they rejected material comfort in favor of a monastic lifestyle. Voluntary poverty. If I'm really poor, that means I'm really walking with Jesus. Asceticism is the basic belief that the material world, including my physical body, is evil. Therefore, I can't indulge in any evil. So the whole world around me and my body is evil. Therefore, I must deprave it. Now, Christians would agree in part with this. Not to deprive yourself, but to discipline yourself. You see the difference? Discipline is important, is it not? Things like fasting are good things. They're helpful things. You ever gone through a difficulty or maybe you had a big decision to make and you fasted on it? We should say our body is the temple of the what? Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We should do what we can to be useful to God during our lifetime. Paul said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Bring it unto order. Discipline my body. But asceticism is different and deeper. Asceticism tries to sanctify the soul by disciplining or depriving the body. In other words, in order to get God's favor, I'm going to deprive my body or discipline my body in harsh ways. And by the way, those that practice this and sometimes still practice it today, they used a term to refer to this. They called it the means of grace. The means of grace. The flogging, the hurt, the pain, all of that they would say is a means of grace. Do you know what grace means? Grace means unmerited favor. <clears throat> How can you merit unmerited favor? <laughs> I 
How do you do something as a means of grace? Grace is undeserved by the receptor, but they call it a means of grace. Now, here's what Paul wants you to know. All of these rules for asceticism are made up. They're all made up. They are made up. They did not come from God. They came from people who made them up. Verse 21 says, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Now, here's the fatal flaw. Here's the flaw with asceticism. Look at verse 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So those who live this way will garner a reputation for spirituality. Whoa, that person is like super spiritual, right? Somebody will see somebody who really hurts themselves they're really miserable looking, and they'll go, wow, that person is walking with Jesus. Miserable looking. They got the joy, joy, joy down in their heart. Look how miserable they look. They've got to be close to God. Man, nobody looks that bad unless they're really, really spiritual. So they'll get a reputation for spirituality. But folks, they may not be spiritual because external rules, external restraints do not produce internal righteousness. It's just another checklist. In fact, asceticism, you know what it feeds? Pride. I'm super spiritual. Look what I'm doing for God. It gratifies our flesh. It makes us feel more spiritual. Listen how Jesus put it. Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. Well, what was their reward for doing this, hurting themselves? People going, those guys are spiritual. That was their reward. That's what they got. People noticing their miserableness and trying to serve the Lord. Here's the great thing about coming to Christ. When you come to Christ, he puts new desires on the inside, does he not? And they work their way from the inside to the outside. Peter calls this partakers of the divine nature. God gives you new appetites when you come to Jesus and experience the Holy Spirit's indwelling at the moment of salvation. Before you came to Christ, you never wanted to read your Bible. Why would you? You didn't understand it. It didn't mean anything to you. Perhaps it was just a big book on the coffee table. You didn't want to go to church. Why would you? A church is a community of believers. You're not a part of that community. You didn't want to have spiritual conversations. Why would you? Before Christ, you were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. That's not a conversation that, 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 that is fun for you, that you would have knowledge of. But you know what happened the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ? The Bible came alive. The church felt like home and spiritual conversations fed your soul. That's what Jesus offers. Folks, don't let anyone render a verdict on your spirituality based on externals. It's not about sacraments. It's not about ceremony. And it's definitely not about rituals or traditions. It is about nothing external. It is not about anything mystical and feeling. All of those, Paul says, are shadows. They have no substance. But Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ as presented in the gospel, he is true substance. He is real. And he wants to radically change your eternal destination and your life forever. I'll close with this. The difference between religion and the gospel, it can be summed up this way. Religion is man's quest for God. The gospel is God seeking the lost. All religion originates on earth. The gospel originated in heaven. Religion is the story of what sinful man tries to do for a holy God. The gospel is the story of what a holy God has done forever for sinful man. Religion may have some good views, 
But the gospel, it's good news. There are many religions, but there's only one gospel. Religion is man-made. The gospel is a gift of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And did I mention it's free? Who likes free stuff? Come on, we know who you are. The same ones that go through Costco and get all the samples. You were hurting during COVID, weren't you? Now you walk through and you're like, yeah, I'm going to Costco. You're not even going to buy something. You're just like, I'm a little hungry right now. I'm going to try all this stuff. And then you try something, even though you're not going to like it, but it's free and you're going to try it. You see, Jesus did all the work. He did all of the heaven lifting for the price of salvation. And all you must do is receive the gift. But here's the thing about a gift. If you give a gift, the gift has to be received, right? Now, if I were to stand up here and I had this nicely packaged gift with a bow and said, I have a gift for all of you today. And you said, Pastor, that's so nice of you. And then you left. The transaction wasn't made, was it? Therefore, the transaction is invalid. You see, the gift has to be taken. It has to be received. It has to be opened. It has to be applied. Jesus wants to give you his free gift of being right with God. Catch this. Not by religious counterfeits, but by simply by faith in Jesus Christ. The authentic, personal relationship with God through his son. Religion cannot offer that. It's not enough. Good works aren't enough, and here's why. You can't do enough good works to be good enough. You never can never be good enough. So God just says, you know what? You'll never be good enough, but I'll be good enough for you by offering Jesus, my son, to take your punishment for your sin that you can't pay. And I offer you my son's righteousness as he takes your sin on him. Tell me a better deal. Jesus takes my sin and he offers me his righteousness. So, the deal of a lifetime <clears throat> leads to the last question. Why haven't you received the gift? Why are, you retrust, why are you trusting counterfeits? You're not complete in religion. You're complete in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is. Today is your opportunity.